anyway, I thank the organizing commission and uh, Melvin Miles, especially for the opportunity to come here. I haven't seen him since I got here a few days ago. Um, <clears throat> I gave a talk at uh, Illinois State University where I work, and they just are now celebrating the separation of the chemistry and physics departments. So <laughs> I thought that was kind of analogous. <laughs> And also, I guess this talk is um, coming close to the sixth anniversary of the Higgs, which involves um, symmetry breaking. And I do want to mention a little bit about symmetry breaking. Um, John and I, John is one of my former graduate students. He's right back there. And we started a little business up. And we make batteries. Has nothing to do with cold fusion. We got interested in cold fusion. It real recently, actually when we saw a 60 minutes version of uh, what um, Dr. McCubrey has been doing. And the, the interest a lot just comes from the absurdity of what um, the scientific community has done to super respected scientists, award winners. And it seems to be a bit of an atrocity. But I want to start. Um, talking about something that we were doing before D-Day. And this is uh, 1986, about three years before, and one of my grad students at that time, Matt Espy, noticed that if you had, in this particular case, carbon that is per deuterated and per proteated carbon and a benzene moiety, and you add a deficient number of electrons, that the isotopically light molecule has preference for the electron. The electron desires the light. That's an EPR spectrum. It's, uh, we do a lot of that, but you don't, there's no interest in that maybe here. But it's a way of looking at these. Deuterons and protons. And one thing I wanted to point out is you can look at that and you can see if you're into EPR that the deuterium is indeed a triplet. It's got a smaller gyromagnetic ratio than does a proton. The other little problem that comes up is why is the deuterium joined? Because it shouldn't be really. It's uh, a spin triplet. So it's the old Hun's rule thing. If they come together, they're going to fall apart, the neutron and proton. But we get around that with isospin. And I, actually, Heisenberg made that up. Now it's part of the electron count rule to figure out isospin. It's a real entity. It has nothing to do with spin. But the neutron is a minus 1 half isospin. The proton is a plus 1 half. So it's a triplet spin, singlet isospin, you don't have the degeneracy pressure, it can obey Fermi-Dirac statistics. But the important point is that the electron destabilizes, loosens bonds, and raises energy. And it does so more so for the deuteriated than the proteated. Um, years later, with a couple of grad students, we teamed up with West Borden at uh, University of Wisconsin. And we were able to understand this quantitatively, perfectly, just you know, from the harmonic oscillator, density functional theory. We published that in Jackson way back, 19, 20 years ago, I guess. And um, it, it's really just a matter of the partition functions of the heavy anion radical over the light and the reverse for the light system. So it's easy to understand, but what, what's kind of important here that we did this with carbon systems a lot, but we're starting to do it with metal systems. But I put an X there, indicating that it doesn't have to be carbon. We've done these with a series of carbon-type molecules. But I said the point is that you add an electron to a X, H, X, H, X, H moiety, and energy goes up. It goes up dramatically. Bonds loosen dramatically. Now, I'll show you how dramatically. 
And I realized, of course, that, you know, the palladium deuter deuter deuteron palladium deuteron system is not quite that simple. It's not linear. I think the carbon analogy is still good. But we do some molecular modeling. I just started to build the cage there. I didn't build the whole thing for palladium deuteride. So we can do some molecular modeling with it and be truly analogous to the carbon system I showed you before. I put the um, time dependent shortage equation there this time just to remind us that you know this is a much more complicated system and we have perturbations upon perturbations, nonlinear equations, extreme time dependence on the initial and the final state. But the point is here that if you have this cage system, and we know this is three-dimensional, but if you warm it up, what it's going to do is start spinning out deuteriums. If you have protons present there, that yellow one is one of an impurity. You have protons present, it'll spit those out too, but the bonds to the deuterium are loosened preferentially. So the deuteriums come off preferentially, thermodynamically, to the protons. And we've done a lot of this stuff, I don't bore you with this slide, but just to show you how dramatic this effect can be, that naphthalene, if we just have naphthalene, you can heat that to 1,000 degrees, your product is hot naphthalene. Put an electron in it. You can pass it through electronically or just drop it in chemically. The naphthalene will now, you just warm it, and it starts spitting off hydrogen. Warm it to 100 degrees, it bubbles off hydrogen quite fast. And we've got all the little glass apparatuses, vacuum lines that won't bore you with to analyze the gases that come off. But that's not important. We've published this stuff a number of years ago. Chuck Rice, the graduate student at that time. But we notice also that I told you those bonds are destabilized. You put two electrons in anthracene. You can't get two in ethylene but, or benzene. But you can in anthracene. You put two, it'll explode. It blows up and it's not minor. It's shocking, you know, ear swelling, shocking. You can feel it in your chest if you have a lot of it. We've avoided injury, <laughs> but we can take very small amounts and put it in a big glass evacuated bulb, shake the bulb, and you can see a spark. And here a little tink, and then you can analyze the gases. Got a little um, local publicity from that. That's way back in 96. But the point is now, if I take the Bravis lattice for palladium deuteride, if one takes it, I shouldn't say I, we're passing electrons through that the bonds to the deuterium are going to be broken preferentially to those to protons. You've got both of them present. So the other thing is that these bonds are going to become very, very labile. There's a quote there by Roel Hoffman to show you that really electrons in the Bravis lattice of a solid is quite analogous to that electrons in a molecule. The other thing is that I would bet if you had a thumb-sized piece of palladium and you had it loaded with deuterium or protons and you started putting electrons through it, you're very liable to get a major explosion, even without an LENR event. If one took place in there, that would come apart just like the carbon systems that are quite analogous would come apart. And as I mentioned to you, when, we, when John and I started this project, we're, we're very naive. We did not know of this conference. We, didn't, we knew that their papers weren't being published. We didn't know where they were being published. We were unaware of the kind of off-mainstream <clears throat> journals. So I kind of will stick to mostly Classical standard model. I shouldn't know it's <laughs> from what we just heard. But again, the series of papers there by important medal winners, people that we admire, Storms, Fleischmann, and uh, they, they're accused of making mistakes in measuring tritium. 
<laughs> this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I mean, there's a minor concentration variance, but you already figured that out many years ago, and these people are way beyond that. So looking at that, that system, we know we're seeing these, that H4 and helium, or tritium, helium and tritium. And we're trying to figure out um, a mechanism for this, and it clearly, I think, we're making protons into neutrons. We're making neutrons. There's got to be neutrons coming from someplace. And of course, it's just standard Feynman diagram. We can't add an electron to a proton at low energies. The proton is the lightest baryon. We talked a minute ago about the, uh, the weak charge, but I, I think that might be discounted now. But that was just published in, in Nature just a few weeks ago. Um, I should mention also maybe the half-life of a uh, neutron has been revised a few weeks ago in science. But we have to under, overcome this hill of 780 keV if we're going to add an electron to a proton. Did I go two? Um, Whittem and Larson, I'm going to stick to things that are published in mainstream journals. I've, I know I maybe shouldn't, but that's all I had access to at the time. I wanted to have access to, I should say. Um, <clears throat> Whittem and Larson found a way around this. And really all he's saying, and he's done it mathematically, it looks good. He's just saying that, <clears throat> you know, if you have an electron crossing this lattice, it has degrees of freedom other than just the x degree of translational freedom. It can go up and down due to the little monopoles in the lattice. And you add all those up, and the electron becomes relativistic, like we were hearing about just a little while ago. And it could possibly tunnel into the proton. Now, what get past the Bohr radius, which is A naught there, 137 times h bar over c me. But that me becomes heavy, and that electron can get captured. The thing I want to mention that you know, the gyromagnetic ratio of an electron is large compared to a proton, almost two orders of magnitude. So that's going to flip the proton, or at least scramble the spin. That's a single proton. Now, if we did that with the deuterium, the electron's going to come into a deuteron, It'll again change an up quark to a down quark, change the proton neutron into a dineutron. Gonna give people frowning. But the dineutron is indeed intact. They're connected. If I were to take two neutrons and bring them together in space, they're never going to come together because isospin is going to keep them apart. But now what we've done is we have the proton and neutron together. The proton in the deuteron, they're connected. They're an isospin a singlet and a spin triplet. The electron that comes in flips the proton. The proton is now a neutron, grabs onto the electron, and we have an isospin triplet, but a spin singlet, and consequently, it's attached. They're connected. It's a trick, sort of, because it's done inside. They're already together. As a proton and neutron, the electron comes in, it flips over. So you're not bringing it together. And um, Werner Hammer, um, who's really well known, published in a very well-known journal, and he estimates that the binding energy is about 20 MeV. But you know what that means. That means that the deuteron can now accept an electron much easier than can a proton, because it's going downhill due to the fact that it forms a dineutron. It's concerted. So we have a downhill system. I, I guess I should mention, I did go through the little 
poly matrices and the isospin matrices. You can look at that. <laughs> Because it just it just shows that the your eigenvalues change, so you don't have a degeneracy. You can, you have a system that'll obey Fermi Dirac statistics. Now we drew out the uh, Bravis lattice there, and I um, mentioned before we do some molecular modeling. And if you model this thing, you don't have space. I said we we're going to break bonds and release deuterium. There's really not enough space. So I was watching one of the uh, videos, and I think it's called Cold Fusion 101, where Professor Engelstein was talking. And he mentioned there had to be an a absent um, metal ion or protons or something to give space. And that works out well. I thank you for that video. That was very nice, very interesting. So well, what we're saying here is that the electrons come through, they, the electrons weaken the palladium deuteron bond. The deuterium drops out. It drops into that cavity. If, by chance, uh, there's another deuterium nearby, now it becomes happenstance, you know, how the spaces are what the morphology of this lattice is. But if by happenstance another deuterium falls, they can join, as shown at the bottom there, and it forms a D2 molecule. Now this is, there's a plethora of electrons flowing through this system. The D2 molecule can now capture an electron in a concerted matter, manner with the formation of the dineutron. And if it does that, we'll have a dineutron in intimate relationship with another deuteron. Again, with a continuous flow of electrons. Now, if we have, let's suppose we have um, some protic impurity. If we have a protic impurity, the same thing's going to happen. It's easier to break the deuterium palladium bond than it is the proton palladium bond. So preferentially, we're going to have deuteriums. But if there are enough hydrogens there, once in a while, one of those will drop down. And again, we have the same thing. So we capture the electron, and it captures exothermically, so we don't have a problem with that. And we have a dineutron, intimate relationship with a proton. I tried to draw out what happens and it drops down into that little cell. Uh, yesterday we saw some, or no, that was this morning, we saw some really interesting molecular modeling. I'm kind of embarrassed now. That's my R index and it's very poor. But I'm trying to show the dineutron and proton inside of there, may, maybe across the diagonal. And it's got phononic pressure. Got electrons go through. Phonons and electrons are everything. You know, we, our students can derive the Einstein crystal through phonons, so they're super important. It's obviously there. It's going to push those two together, and we're actually inside of one of those. I, that's, again, very poor. I'm doing molecular modeling, trying to get my computer to finish a quantum mechanical calculation, and I had to load it before it finished. That's why it got kind of blurry. But if you look inside there, you can see that's the little cell that it's in. But that's space filling. That's a space filling diagram. So it shows how little space there is and why we need that empty space that Professor Hagelstein said we need. I put three of them together there. But it's a nuclear active environment. I'm just going to draw it as a blob from now on. And so as my skills with art are poor. <laughs> but, um, <coughs> The point is now, we have no Coulombic repulsion to overcome. We have a proton and a dineutron coming together, phononic, phononic pressure. They get close enough. They can undergo tunneling and join. I'm not even sure what the pressure is going to be preventing them from coming together. But uh, Shriners pointed out just months ago you know, that almost always you should consider and it's the next paradigm of reactions. So I want it in there. Uh, John and I have a little bit of experience with tunneling. We published something back in 202 and Jack's involving 
um, atoms moving back and forth in a <coughs> tub conformation. It's not totally relevant, but just to show you we have a little bit of idea what we're doing. So what we have there now is that proton comes into the dineutron, very little resistance. There we go, helium, or tritium, and it's an electron-catalyzed formation of tritium. Now go back to the same thing we were talking about with the deuterium. Suppose that um, it's not a, a proton that drops down, but two deuteriums. Then something analogous happens. Only now we got the dineutron phononically compressed into a deuteron. What's going to happen? It has to be hydrogen 4. Hydrogen 4 is well known. It's got a lifetime of 136 yoctoseconds. <laughs> not very long. It's obviously we're not doing that. But, you know, they form hydrogen 4 by shooting neutrons into tritium. And all it does is spit the neutron back out. And it's in a high spin state because the neutron comes in again, the Hans Rule type thing. You know. So the proton and the tritium's up, and that new neutron's up, and they're spin forbidden to come back together. But what we're maintaining is we're producing hydrogen 4M. And that would be true because the di neutron, as I mentioned before, is a um, spin singlet. Iso spin singlet and a spin or a spin singlet, iso spin triplet. Said it wrong again. Spins are both together, iso spins. Uh, iso spins are together, <laughs> spins are opposite. Okay, so we get so we're forming this hydrogen 4M, and I think it's really just a spin isomer of hydrogen 4. A hydrogen 4M undergoes an internal conversion and goes to helium 4. And that's the second one down there. But I put those other reactions just to show you that the internal conversion is well known. It's a real common thing. So there's nothing special about that. This can happen because the mass of the hydrogen 4M metastable hydrogen 4, is less than that of a tritium and a neutron, is greater than that of a helium and an, an alpha particle and an electron, or a helium. So the internal conversion allows us to go directly then to hydrogen or to helium 4. Again, another, come with the grab me, get alpha potato, okay. Um, I just wanted to show you the spin interactions here about this um, metastable hydrogen. As I mentioned before, Hunsville, we've got the uh, two electron, uh, the two nuclei in a place where they can't relax together because it's spin forbidden in hydrogen 4. It just spits that neutron back out, as we mentioned before, and it does it very, very, very fast. And the way the spins are arranged in are now proposed 4M hydrogen that the new neutron and the proton are spin aligned, low energy state. It can easily fall back down, form the helium 4. So that diagram shows the energy levels and what is going on in, in forming the hydrogen 4. Hydrogen four. So what, what we're saying is that we really just have a palladium deuteride, add an electron, we get a tremendous amount of heat. We're going through hydrogen 4M. It's really the dineutron, which is stable and connected, that's interacting with our, that timer is making me nervous, with our deuteron and we get all of these effects. And you notice we got some alpha particles, we got some neutrons, and as I mentioned before, these things, you just gotta wait for the things to drop together, the deuterium, and come together and form our reaction. 
This is taken directly from a uh, paper by Fleischmann. I just lifted it off. And this thing goes for like three months. Nothing happens. You've got to wait for deuterium to come down, another one to come down together. And we have extreme dependence on initial conditions, scientific chaos. The reaction starts months later, it goes up and down and up and down from 32 to 60 degrees, back down to 30, back and forth. It just looks like scientific chaos. I think that we're all looking at scientific chaos to some degree. You can look at a lot of papers and you'll see that. That heat effect is, corresponds with the helium-4 ash and Melvin Miles has um, proven that, I think, beyond any doubt in 1993, as been mentioned before at this conference. So the, I noticed just also um, months ago, uh, the Mosher Boss and McCubray group, group have seen both the flux, feeble flux of alpha particles and neutrons. And this little paradigm that um, I'm trying to outline explains the evolution of uh, hydrogen-4, evolution of hydrogen-4, the ostensible extra thermodynamic heat. It's not really extra thermodynamic, it's nuclear. It explains the evolution of, evolution of tritium and why helium-4 is much more intense than tritium. And we talked about the alpha flux of chaotic sustainability. It's scientific chaos. It, it's hard to reproduce. Even if everything's right, it's probably hard to reproduce just because there's happenstance and you have four nonlinear equations producing the effect. The other thing, I just want to mention one last thing, the stoichiometric difference between, okay. Two minutes? Can I have 30 seconds? 30 seconds, okay. <laughs> the stoichiometric difference between Le and R and muon fusion is confirmed. And that, you know, Melvin Miles suffered a horrific attack from Henson and Jones, Hansen and Jones way back, and one of their attack reasons is, hey, we did muon fusion, you don't get the same result we got. No. <laughs> that was in Journal of Physical Chemistry. It, just one other thing, I, I, this was done, of course, before I witnessed a lot of what's going on here, but um, it, Storms also showed, I think a few years ago at one of these meetings, that the 108 palladium crosses 106 during an LER experiment. That's the addition of two neutrons. So it's a dineutron. Anyway, I uh, thank you and thank, you. thank NSF and all of that stuff. <laughs> I'd be happy to ask questions. I have a, a short question. Okay. Uh, I have seen uh, your scheme with the internal conversion uh, decay. Yes. So uh, internal conversion uh, uh, has good probability to occur when the energy jump is uh, low. In the case right. of uh, helium-4 uh, in the excited states, we have 24 MeV to be released. So it should be uh, with a low probability to occur the, in that case. Exactly. Yeah. The energy is very low is so that you can capture that electron. It, it, it's analogous to that um, lead system, which I shown. John actually was uh, consulting with one of the large uh, refineries, and they have a lead 106 problem. But the electron gets out, the beta particle gets out occasionally with that system. But we're arguing it does not with H4M. Are, are you saying that the neutron is bound? I'm saying the dye neutron, neutron is, is bound. bound. It's well, bound. You know the <coughs> all the NN, you know the sc scattering length of NN, scattering length of ANN. Yes, but. It, it shows never bound. And the, true. Yeah. But the trick is they never come together in the first place. If, if you have, they're already together and they're 
then you said that uh, t, uh, let's see, t equal one, i equal zero state is bound. You are saying that. But if so, I why? Spin, yeah, I say spin, spin zero, spin singlet, I spin triplet, I spin triplet is also in the deuterium state. You know that? No, deuterium is a isospin is an isospin but singlet. Yes. In, in the deuterium, we also have isospin isospin triplet. Okay. That's unbound. Okay. And yeah. and also I agree. that is the same group as a dineutron. Dineutron and isospin one uh, spin zero and diproton. These are the same group and never bound. Okay, but calculations show it's a, it's a pi unless there they're not bound. That's why I put that up. They come together, exchange pi zero, pi on, they're not bound. Yeah. Hammer, I, I'm using reference now. <laughs> Hammer shows that they are bound. The, the beryllium because so far, 12 experiments, they shoot. So far, many people. As dineutron out, they come together, they go across the lab, and they're still bound. Otherwise, they go apart. Yeah, they That's go apart. It's one of the references on there. Okay. We'll argue that. But I'm aware of the calculations, the Japanese calculations way back, and it's not bound. But apparently, that's not the case anymore. And you could argue with Hammer about that. Knows a lot more about it than I do, but anyway, they ha it has to be the dineutron, otherwise you wouldn't have helium four. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.